Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to lecture number 20. Well, in this lecture, I'd like to continue with something that I didn't finish last time. So I would like to show you more examples of, uh, of how to graph uh, functions. Uh, we will, and last time, if I remember correctly, we did uh, the first and the second derivatives. We have seen uh, the intervals of monotonicity or concavity of a, of a function. And based on this, we have uh, drawn the graph of some functions. So I would like to continue with that because I haven't finished the lecture last time. And also today I will cover something even more. I will do more. And in fact, we will uh, stick to curve sketching, but this time we will be talking about uh, uh, asymptotes as well. You will see about vertical and horizontal asymptotes. And these uh, two uh, notions will involve also the limits at the infinity. All right, so let's get started. So let me continue with, um, with some other examples from, from last time. And so last time we have talked about this example, right? That's what we did last time, if I remember correctly. Right, so we have, see, we have seen, we've, uh, we took this function f of x, x to the fourth minus four x cubed. And we have seen on what intervals is this function in, um, increasing or decreasing. We found the relative extrema. We also uh, found the inflection points and also the intervals where f is concave up or down. And then at the end, we grab this function. Great. Now let me veer to, uh, um, towards another application. So another example, well, the graph is already given, but just ignore the right part. So I would like you to think of the following example. Let, let's consider f of x to be, f of x is x minus two sine of x. And we'll define this function f. So let me just write it here again. So f is defined on this interval zero two pi. And this is a real value. And f of x is nothing other than just x minus two sine of x. All right, so this is the function. So we're interested in the same thing. So we would like to see where this function is increasing or decreasing, or we would like to find any relative extrema. And then again, on what intervals um, is f uh, concave up or concave down, and also to find the inflection points. And then at the end, we should grab this function. So please ignore the, the picture for the moment. So I would like you to think of this for a bit. So what, what is the third, first thing that we should do here? Come on, tell me. Do you answer the first two questions? So what, what, what should we do? Exactly, so we should find the derivative first. Let me just uh, separate these. So we should find the derivative first, and then what else? Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly, and set it equal to zero. So that's the first thing that we need to do. So let's compute the derivative. The derivative is given by what? Well, if you look at the function, it's quite easy to compute the derivative. Let me write it here. F prime of x is what? Tell me, I want you to tell me. One minus, exactly, one minus two cosine of x. Great, so that's the derivative. So that's the function f, that's the first derivative. And now we're gonna set this equal to zero. And once we do this, well, you see, we have this and we have to solve this equation here. F prime of X, which is um, one minus two cosine of X equals zero. So in other words, we need to solve the equation cosine of X equals one half. And what solution do we have for this? So this is equivalent with cosine of X, it's one half. 
And what solutions do we have for this? Can you tell me for this equation? So for what values of x we, um, does cosine of x equals 1 half? Yes, I'm all ears. So what values? For example, pi over three, right? Yeah, okay, pi over three, yeah, all right. It, but this is, is this the only value? So you see, I have the interval zero to pi and I have pi over three. And, and if you look at the trigonometric circle, is this the only value? It's also five pi over three. Guys, I would suggest uh, you to go back to the trigonometric um, table. When you see the quadrants, the first, the second, the third, and the fourth, and you will see for which values uh, we have cosine of something equal to uh, to something else, right? You don't you don't just look in the first quadrant. You also look in the uh, the fourth quadrant as well. So, in fact, we will have two solutions here, right? These are the two solutions. You look at them. Pi over three and five pi over three. So these are the solutions. Oh, quite great. And now we will draw the chart. And now let's see. Between zero and pi over three, so we're just going to take a value there. We're going to plug in a value for, for the derivative. And I'll leave this to you as an exercise. We will get a negative value here. Between pi over 3 and 5 pi over 3, we'll get a positive value, right? So this will be the derivative is positive. And here, between 5 pi over 3 and 2 pi is negative. So this means that when, uh, so this is for the derivative. So here on this interval, uh, here, uh, so let me just, so here, f prime of x is negative, and the same goes here. And here, on this thing here, f prime of x is positive. And there we go. So this means that the function will be increasing on this interval, right? So on this interval here, pi over three, five pi over three, because as you can see, we have a plus here, so the derivative is positive. And the function will be decreasing on this interval right here, on this union of intervals, right? As you can see it here. So zero uh, pi over three uh, united with five pi over three and two pi. All right, and we'd like to decide. So we know that these are the relative extrema. So these two points here, right? Pi over three and five pi over three. So this over three here. Right, and we like to decide which one is a relative. Maybe I shouldn't do that because it's uh... so these two here, and we would like to decide which one is uh, relative min or relative max. Well, if you plug it in and if you compute it, you will have it here. Well, I I don't have a calculator, but you should believe me. So f of pi over uh, over three, let me write it here, is negative 0.6849, um, and f of five pi over three is equal to uh, 6.968. Uh, so as you can see, this is uh, the smallest value, negative point something, whatever. And 6.9 something is the largest, larger value. So this guy will be a relative min, this guy here, and this guy will be a relative max. So we should be careful. All right, great.
So we have done with these two. And now we would like to see where the function is concave up and concave down. So what do you think? What should we do for this? Exactly, so for, we will apply the second derivative test. So in other words, we're gonna take the, the second derivative of f, and let me write it here, and f second prime of x will be equal to what? Can you tell me? Two sine of x, exactly. And, it will, it, and if we like to, um, to find out the inflection point, what should we do? What should we do if you want to find? Exactly, we're going to set it equal to zero. But I hope somebody else will answer because I know I just I don't want to talk only to Zach. Exactly, so we're going to set it equal to zero, right? And guess what? What are the solutions for this equation? So two sine of x equals zero. In other words, when sine of x is zero, so it's zero at what? Can you tell me? Well, when sine of x is zero, at zero once, at pi, right, at 90 degrees, and at two pi, right? So we will have that these are the inflection points. And now we'll have to decide, right? We'll have to decide on what interval is the function concave up and concave down. Well, you see, we have we're going to divide this in. Uh, so we, since we have three points, um, well, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to say them inflection points, inflection numbers because inflection points will be something when the function changes the concavity, but anyway. So let's see, on the interval zero pi, the derivative will be positive, right? You can take a value, anyway, whatever value you want, I'm gonna leave this to you. So this will be positive here. And then on the interval pi and two pi, this will be negative. So this means that since, so here it's for the derivative, so this is f prime of x is positive, plus f second prime of x, sorry, is positive. And here, f second prime of x is negative. So being negative, you will have concave down, right? And being positive, you'll have concave up, right? Okay, and the inflection point, you see the inflection point there where the, the function changes its concavity is pi. So we need to evaluate f of pi. And f of pi, if you look at it, right, is nothing else than just pi. So f of pi, so the inflection point will be pi pi because f of pi is nothing else than just pi minus two sine of pi but sine of pi is zero, so this is pi. So this point pi pi of coordinates pi and pi is uh, the inflection point for this function. And now we can draw the graph. And if you look at the graph, just look at it. I start from zero here. I look at, I go all the way to here. So this is my relative minimum. Then I'm going all the way to this point of coordinates pi pi, which we said that the function will change its concavity. Right, it's, it's concave up, uh, then it will be concave down. It reaches all the way up to this point, which is a relative max, and it ends up here, right? So this is the inflection point. So let me just write on the graph. So this is this guy here is the inflection point. Right? This guy here 
that you see here is um, what we call a relative min. So this guy is a relative min. And th this guy here that you see here is a relative max. Right? And if you look on this portion, once again, let me, uh, in fact, let me use this. On this portion here, you see on this portion, this function here on this portion is uh, concave up. And then on the other portion is concave down. So let me just write it here, concave up. And on this one here, concave down. And that's how we draw the graph of a function. All right, great. Let's do one more example. And I'd like you to look at this, this guy, Rook. Again, forget about the graph for the moment. Let's look at this example. <clears throat> so in this case, we, we, we have this function, we have this product of functions. As you can see, uh, it will be a little bit um, more difficult to, um, well, difficult. Yeah, a little bit more difficult to take the derivative of f. So f of x is given by this product, the product of two, these two functions. So it's 6x to the power 2 thirds times 5 by minus 2x. And again, we want to find the same thing. We want to find the, uh, the, uh, the intervals of monotonicity. We want to find the extrema, re the relative extrema. We would like to find uh, out the intervals of concavity, inflection points, and then at the end, we would like to graph this function. All right, so I want you to think of it. So what should we do first? Again, we should compute the derivative, right? <clears throat> and the derivative will be a little bit tricky to compute. So what should we use uh, in order for us to compute the derivative? What should we do? Exactly, so we should use the product rule. So um, for us to compute the derivative, the derivative, So for the derivative, we use the product rule. Right? All right, so we have this function, so let's do it. Let me remind you the product rule says the following that um, f, G, f times g prime is f prime times g plus g prime times f, so that's the product rule, right? All right, great. So let's do it. Uh, first, we should compute the derivative. Now, let, let me just um, do it separately because we have two functions here. You see, you have this portion here and we have this one, let me do it with another color, this portion here, right? And let's compute the derivative of each one of them. So let's, let me call this H and this is G. So G of X and this is H of X. All right, so let's write separately um, um, 
So h prime of x, I'm gonna write it here, is nothing else than just minus two, right? And g prime of x is what? Can you tell me what is g prime of x? <clears throat> what is it? Well, exactly. Uh, Josh, uh, Josh says four times x to the power negative two thirds. Exactly. Wait, negative two thirds. Are you sure negative two thirds? Negative one third, exactly. So four times b. Pay attention to the derivatives. If you make a mistake like this in the exam, imagine is that basically you made a mistake right from the beginning. So everything will just you're not going to find any uh, any multiple choice. You're not going to find any answer there, and you'll be like, "Whoa, what did I do wrong?" So make sure you compute the derivatives right. All right, no problem. It happens. All right, so we have this, and then we apply the product rule there. And then at the end, when you compute the derivative, you will get this. Anyway, the details, I'll leave them to you. And then we'll, be, we'll end up with, if we do the algebra here. So again, here, just let me just uh, say it. This is the product rule here again. I want to make myself clear, right? All right, and we end up with this equation here. So we would like to solve this equation. Well, if you look at it, can you tell me what are the solutions for, uh, for this equation? What are they? So what are the critical numbers? Well, you, you have the solution x equals one, right? But also the problem is that you have this guy, uh, you have a fraction and the cube root of x is different than zero. So you should take into uh, critical number also zero. So the critical numbers are these guys here, zero and one. And we should be careful at zero because you cannot plug in the value zero. So basically, <clears throat> the zero will not be touched. So we'd like to see on the interval negative infinity zero, if you plug in a value, let's say a negative one, you'll get uh, here negative. I'm not gonna plug, I'm gonna plug it in. I'm just gonna leave it to you. Then between zero and one is positive. And then from one, all the way to infinity, this will be negative. So here, the derivative, so in between these two, f prime of x is positive. And here, this is negative. So, Again, you'll find that since uh, the, uh, the, derivatives, uh, the, uh, the derivative of f is negative on those two intervals, except zero, one, then this means that the function will be decreasing from um, negative infinity to zero united with one infinity, and it will be increasing on this interval here, zero, one, right, open interval, great. And now we would like to see um, which one is a relative, what is a relative min and a relative max? So we would like to plug in zero. And let's do that. F of zero is what? Can you tell me? So remember we have those two critical numbers, zero and one, and you have to plug in F, a zero for F. We would like to see what happens. F of zero is what? Is is zero, right? If you plug it in, plug it in into the original function, and f of one is what? 
And for one is six times three, 18. So we have these two points of coordinates zero, zero, and one, 18. And we would like to decide which one is a relative min, which one is a relative max. So what do you think? Hmm? Zero, zero will be what? Will be a relative min. And then the point 118 will be a relative max. So by just applying the first derivative test, so we will get this. All right. All right, great. So we've determined the first two and we'd like to move on where the function is concave up and concave down and found the, find the inflection points. So for this, we need to do what? What do we need to do? Second derivative, exactly. So we need to compute the second derivative and set it equal to zero. Oh my, if you look at that second derivative. Anyway, I'm just gonna leave it to you as an exercise. So the second derivative is this, this mess right here. So I'll leave this to you as an exercise to figure it out. And then after doing the algebra, we will end up with this equation here. So this mass will be, turn out to be equivalent with this. So it's negative 20 minus 40 X, everything over three times X to the power of four thirds equals zero. Right? Okay. Anyway, and what are the solutions for this? Again, we'll uh, get, if we solve this, so we have negative 20 uh, minus 40 X equals zero. So X will be negative one half, okay? So this will be the solution for this equation, right? And now we would like to see on the interval zero and negative infinity one half, we will get a positive. So the second derivative is positive. So this means that the function is concave up. And on the interval, um, negative one half infinity, the, uh, the second derivative is negative. So the function will be concave down, as you can see here, right? And concave up will be here. And we also would like to find the inflection point. And we, for the inflection point, we would just have to compute f of um, negative one half. So f of negative one half, we'll give it this guy here, 36 times cube root of one over four. So that's the inflection point. So this gives us the inflection point. And that's it, as you can see it here. Anyway, I'll leave this algebra to you. And now, we, as you can see, if you look at the graph, so the graph would look something like this. You just look at it, you see? Um, the function is concave down, right? From negative one half, uh, wait. So it goes like this. Oh my. And it reaches all the way up to this point, which is a relative max. And then it goes to a relative min here, but doesn't touch it. And then it goes up to this inflection point where it changes that. So this will be here. Um, so this is 118, this is a relative max. Um, this guy here is the inflection point. Right? And this guy here, but doesn't touch it. So this is a relative min. Anyway, so this is how the graph of F would look like. So I'd like you to pay attention because you will have problems like this on the, on the final exam. But in any case, we'll solve more of these kind of problems when we, um, when we, um, um, talk about when we will have the review session before the final exam. 
All right, let's see quickly. Do you have any questions regarding this? This example? No questions, all right, great. Um, now then let me start with um, the, a new lecture that we will, let me uh, tell you more about the curve sketching. And this time we'll be, this will, be uh, will involve what we call asymptotes. So these asymptotes is, uh, I told you at the beginning of lectures, of the lecture is, are um, two of them. Well, there are more, but we're just gonna say, we're gonna talk uh, in the first instance, at first we will talk about um, two of them, vertical and horizontal asymptote. And let's see, and we will, you will see that this will, uh, we will also discuss about limits involving infinity because we haven't talked, we haven't touched this subject. Now, to be honest with you, I disagree with the fact how the book does it, but anyway, they leave the limits involving infinity at the, they don't, they're uh, separate from other limits, which uh, for me, it doesn't make sense. I would like to study all of them, but anyway, uh, this is this, uh, how it's, this is the syllabus, so. All right, so first, let me talk about vertical and horizontal asymptote. And let's see what these are. And then we will see how to deal with these um, by just computing some limits involving infinity. All right, so um, we say that the line x equals c, so uh, x equals c, that c is a constant. I'm gonna make myself clear. So this is a constant. The line uh, x equals c is a vertical asymptote uh, to the graph of f, if one of these two happen, right? Uh, if the limit is, um, if the left-hand limit uh, of f as x approaches c is infinite, well, plus minus infinity, or the right-hand limit as x approaches c of f is infinite, right? As you can see, we have this uh, sketched very uh, nicely here. As you can see, this is the graph of F. Ouch, sorry about that. Let me draw it again. It goes like this. You see, it doesn't touch the line. And also we, we have something like this as well. And if you look at this line here, x equals c, doesn't touch the graph, but it's almost there. So this is what we will call a vertical asymptote. So again, the line x equals c, so this guy here, so this line, so in other words, there is a line that the graph will not touch, but it will be almost there. So it's a vertical asymptote to the graph of F if one of these two happen. So this, this, or this, right? Okay. All right, so uh, <clears throat> this is what we call a vertical asymptote. And now we would like to see what, um, what is a uh, horizontal asymptote. Right, let me, so let's see. So now the horizontal asymptote, as you can see, vertical is on the X axis, right? And Y uh, will be, well, it's vertical and then horizontal. So the, uh, the same thing here, the line y equals L, right? As you can see, is what we will call a horizontal asymptote to the graph of F if, and pay attention here, if the limit this time at infinity, so a, a positive infinity of F is, uh, is L, or the limit 
as uh, x approaches negative infinity of f is L. So in other words, imagine that we have something, the graph of f is like this, which goes like this, see, doesn't touch it, goes like this here. And also the same thing happens here. As you can see, it goes down, doesn't touch it, goes, goes, goes like this. So this line here, this line that you see here, you see, this is what we call the horizontal asymptote. So this line y equals L, right? So if one of these two conditions are met, so again, now this is how we distinguish the vertical is x equals the constant and horizontal y equals constant. But that constant in the case of, uh, you can see um, in the case of, um, if you take the limit as x approaches that constant and it has to give you infinity. On the, in the case of horizontal asymptote, you take the limit uh, at infinity and it has to give you that constant, right? You see the difference this and here, this. Let me see if I, can put both of them here and here. Okay, so that is a game changer now because you see, if you look at these two, the limit as x approaches infinity of f and the limit as x approaches negative infinity of f, this means that we need to evaluate, so this and this, so forces us to evaluate, so we need to evaluate limits at infinity. So that's what we need to do. Okay, great. So let's do that. How do we evaluate limits at infinity? And let me start with an example. I want you to look at this. And um, by looking at this, I would like you to, so we, we would like to find the limit as X approaches infinity of this uh, ratio, of this quotient, of this rational function. So the limit as X approaches infinity of three X squared minus X. So this is what you have on the top. And 2x squared plus 1, that's on the bottom. So let's see. What does your intuition tell you? Conjugate, conjugate with what? Do you have you don't have any radicals? Oh. So you don't have any radicals. So let's see, what do we have on the on the top? If you look at the function, what, what is that? It's a quadratic function, right? And on the bottom, it's again a quadratic function. So you see the degree of the two, both on the top and bottom is the same, is degree two. Right, so let me just uh, tell you this. So if P of X is, um, 3x squared minus x and q of x is 2x squared plus 1. And we need to evaluate um, the limit as, so basically we need to evaluate this. So you see they have the, uh, the same degree and 
What does it mean x limit at infinity? When you say this limit as x approaches infinity, you mean for x large enough. So x is large enough. Is infinity. So if you replace, let's say, by infinity, you'll have here infinity squared, which is infinity minus infinity, and that would be indeterminate. Well, here we go again. You see, there's another thing that I don't like in the, in the calculus um, syllabus, because they don't teach you right from the beginning which, which one are the indeterminate. Uh, the indeterminates for, uh, for limits of functions. And in fact, there are seven of them. Hmm. Let me write them here. Uh, so this is, these are the indeterminates for, the, for limits. For limits of functions. And I'm going to write them here so that you guys can see them. So first we dealt with, um, if you remember, with radicals, it was infinity minus infinity. Then we dealt with infinity over infinity or zero over zero. Another one that we will see will be involved one to the power infinity. The other one will be infinity to the power zero. Then another one is zero to the zero. One, two, six. Um, there is another one that I'm missing. Uh, let's see, which one is it? Uh, zero to zero. Infinity times zero. So these are the indeterminates. So if you plug in x infinity, you see at the top, you have infinity minus infinity, already is indeterminate. And on the bottom, and let's just say that would be infinity. Let's just assume by some miracle. Well, it is infinity, but anyway, we have to prove that. So let's see, the, let's assume from, for the moment that uh, on the top, you deal with infinity. Then on the bottom, we also have infinity. So it will be infinity over infinity. So we need to do something. And since we haven't learned the L'Hopital rule yet, and I saw some of you already use this in, uh, in the exam, well, um, let's do something. And what we will do is the following. So we're gonna force uh, a factor, uh, the x to the greatest power. So that's what, we're, what we will do. So you see, you have your x squared, I'm having here x squared. So maybe I should force x squared as a factor on, the on both the top and the bottom. So let's do that. And you will see why am I doing this? So this would be, the limit as x approaches infinity. Oh, and let's force it here. It will be x squared times three minus x over x squared. And here on the bottom will be um, x squared times two plus one over x squared. Now x squared and x squared will cancel, right? And this will give us the limit as x approaches infinity of three minus, here again, x with the next will cancel. So three uh, minus one over x, everything over two plus one over x squared. All right, now in, we're in, at this point, as x approaches infinity, one over x will approach what? What can you tell me? This approaches what? So finite over infinite is zero, correct. And what about this guy would be what? This will approach again zero. So the limit is three over three over two. Hmm, what do you see? Oh. You see that this is nothing else than just the ratio of the coefficients of this, um, of x to the greatest power, both on top and the bottom. Hmm, great. So the same, let me show you um, how I did it in my slides. It's the same thing though, but uh, it's a little bit unnatural here because I multiply by these guys, the same guy. 
and doesn't explain why. So this is why we force x to the greatest power. And then we end, we end up with the same thing. And you see, this guy goes to zero. This guy goes to zero. And there you go, you have three halves. All right, let's see another one. Do you have any questions regarding this example? <laughs> Is everything clear so far? Is it? All right. All right, I'm glad to hear that. Well, let me draw your attention with another example. I want you to look at this. So we would like to find the limit as X approaches infinity of this ratio again. And as you can see, the situation will, is a bit uh, different now. On the top, we have a linear function. So the simplest linear function, if you want, x. And on the bottom, we have uh, something involving radicals. It's 2 square root of x plus 3. All right. And we would like to find this limit as x approaches infinity. So what do you think? Or if you want, you, you can write this as, okay, let me, <clears throat> so you can write this as, um, as this. So this will be the limit as x approaches infinity of x over 2 squared of x plus 3. No, sorry, I'm not, Jesus. 2 x to the power 1 half, if you want to, plus 3. It's the same thing. So what do you think? Here you have x to the power of one. one. So what do you think the limit will be? So what should we do? So on the, on the top, we just have x, so we don't need to do anything. We can force x to the greatest power, which is x. So, But on the bottom, what should we do? We can also force an x, right? Or, or x to 1 half as a, common, uh, as, a, uh, as a factor. So this would be, let me write it here the limit as x approaches infinity of x over, and here I'm gonna force x to one half, and here I have two plus three over x to one half. And this will be the limit as x approaches infinity of what? x and x with, with one half will just go away, and here it's we're left with x to one half, right? It's one minus one half, which is one half. So it's x to one half over two plus three over x to the power one half. Now, what can you tell me? As x approaches infinity, this will approach what? As x approaches infinity, x to one half will approach what? The square root of x, basically. Come on, tell me. Infinity, exactly. So this guy approaches infinity. But this guy here, so this is appro this approaches zero. So it's infinity at the end. It's infinity over two plus zero, which is infinity. Right? Well, in a similar fashion, you can do it in the slides. I did it in the following way. So I just forced uh, a factor. See, this is a very unnatural way of putting it, but anyway. So I, I multiply and divide it both by one over square root of x. And once we do this, we'll end up, so we multiply by this guy here. Why do we multiply by this? Anyway, it's a mystery. I, I explained you why. So you, you tend to take the top 
you force the x to the greatest uh, factor out. You take the bottom, you force x to the greatest factor out, and that's it. And then at some point they will can cancel out some or some power will cancel out. But here you just want, multiply and divide by one over square root of x, and you'll end up with this guy here. And then this guy is quite clear because this is uh, goes to zero, so this will be infinity. All right, is everything clear about this example? But both methods are work uh, effectively. It doesn't matter which method you prefer, I don't care. So as long as you solve the problem, that's what matters to me. All right, let me tell you something about more about the infinity. Look at these limits. Hmm. And let's just uh, explain this a bit. So what do you think about the limit as x approaches infinity of e to the power x? Well, if you plug in infinity, if, well, if you, you will get x to the power infinity, which is infinity. So that would be obvious. But what about this one? Why is this um, the limit as x approaches infinity of e to the negative x is 0? Why is that? Tell me, why is this true? Exactly, exactly. Like Abdul says, it's one over e to the power x, and as x approaches infinity, is one over infinity, based on, and it's zero. Correct. Yeah, exactly. What about this one? Why is this zero? What can you tell me about this one? So this guy here, let me just say e to the negative x is 1 over e to the x. And since we know that the limit as, e, um, as x approaches infinity of e to the x is infinity, then you have 1 over infinity, which is 0. All right, let's see the third one, the third and fourth one. Why the, the limit as x approaches infinity of e to the negative x times cosine of x is 0, and the same thing go, uh, goes for, uh, for sine. So e to the negative x times sine of x is 0. So why are these two limits equal to zero? Why? Why, what did we say about, um, okay, first of all, we have a product here, right? And what can you tell me about this guy? As x approaches infinity, this guy will uh, approach what? Can you tell me? Based on previous considerations, this will approach? Zero, exactly. The same thing goes here. And what did we say about the cosine and sine functions? What did we say about these two functions? What did we say about them? Come on. They have this amazing property, sine and cosine. And that amazing property is that is what? Is that they're bounded. So sine, cosine, take value between negative one and one. So this thing is bounded. And we said that a long time ago. You see, you forgot. That's why it's good to have to do all limits together. We said that the product uh, of, a, of a function that uh, approaches zero, right, that um, has limit zero, and, uh, and uh, a function that is bounded, will, that product will converge also to zero. So that's why. That's why both of these, oops, that's why both of these two, both of these two guys will approach zero. So that's what you need to know. All right, okay. Have this in mind because this will be important, especially when we will talk, when we will try to find vertical and horizontal asymptotes. So keep this in mind. Is it, does it make sense? Is it clear? For everybody? Again, the product of our two functions 
and in which one of them converges to zero and the other one is bounded will converge to zero. All right, great. Now, let me tell you how the power would look like. So tower of power. You see, the funny thing is that um, mm, as x approaches infinity, many functions will approach infinity. So you have e to the x, x, both of them approaches infinity. But you know, there's a starting line. So both of them are running. And the, the question is, which one crosses the infinity line, let's say, uh, first? So which one is faster than the other one? Right, as you can see, all these functions here, e to the x, x to 100, x squared, x squared of x, cube root of x, ln of x, these, all of them, as x approaches infinity, will approach infinity, right? But the question is, which one uh, crosses, like I said, the infinity line um, faster? So in other words, we would like to see um, which one grows uh, faster than the other. So in other words, look at this limit. Let me draw your attention with this limit. Lem as x approaches infinity of ln of x over x. As you can see, x grows faster than ln of x. So here, x grows faster than ln of x. Right, so if X grows faster, as you can, because you see this guy will approach infinity as well. This guy will approach infinity. So you have infinity over infinity, which is indeterminate, but when we deal with these two functions, definitely ln of X over X is zero. Again, we will prove this, um, and I'm gonna put here a question mark, that we'll prove this when we'll talk about L'Hopital rule. So, um, Probably going to talk about this next week for sure, maybe even Monday. All right, the same thing will happen uh, with this as um, with the limit as x approaches infinity of x squared over e to the x. So, in other words, we can say that the exponential e to the x grows faster than x squared than the quadratic. So that's why we have that this guy is zero. And also another example, another eloquent example, is that the square, you see, the square root, which is x to one half, so this guy here is x to the power one half, grows faster than even this combination here, because we only deal with x to the power one fourth, so the degree is, is uh, smaller. As we have seen here, right? Look, you see? Because this guy here, we wrote it in this way here, you see? So the degree of this is one, the degree of this is one half, so it's larger. So that's why we have something like this here. And now if you look at the tower, you see the, the you see, this is the infinity finish line. So the first place, so let me just call this, the infinity finish line. Imagine this is like the uh, infinity sprint. So they just run these guys here that you see, they run all the way to catch up the infinity finish line. Of course, in finite time, this will never happen, but imagine that this we're talking about infinity, something very large that doesn't stop. And guess what? First place, it's x to the power x. So this is the winner. The second place will be the factorial, x factorial. But here we have a, well, uh, the definition could be tricky because we need to define this for integers, for positive integers. And when we want to define factorial for, um, for real numbers, and that's, that's a bit tricky there, or for positive numbers, we need to involve some kind of a gamma function, whatever, I don't want to get into it, but anyway, just leave it like that. Then you, you have the exponential, let's say the third place. You see three is bigger than E, so this is the fourth place. And the power comes fifth, and then you see uh, as the power, um, 
grows, uh, well, the power is more, sorry, uh, it will be sixth and so on. And so on. And you see the last one of the very finish line is ln of x. This is the, the last one. So it doesn't grow uh, fa fast enough. It grows very um, slowly. But it's still, so this is last place. But still, it crosses the infinity finish line, although it's, uh, it's not as fast as the others. So that's the top. This is what you need to know. So the first one is x. And we actually have a notation for this. Let me just tell you, like, for example, we can say that L of x is less, less than x. So this means that the limit as x approaches infinity of L of x over x is 0. So L of x is much, much smaller than x. That's uh, how we're going to, that's the notation. Anyway. Now we would like to see uh, all this information. We'd like to see it through some examples. And we'd like to find some vertical and horizontal asymptotes for certain functions. So the first example is the following. So these are the examples. So that's the first example. Find the vertical and horizontal asymptotes of f of x. And this function f of x is given by this one here. Um, f of x is 4x minus 2 over x minus 3. So what should we do for vertical and horizontal asymptotes? But first, let's start with the vertical asymptote. So what would be the vertical asymptote? What did we say? Do you remember? Let's go back. Look at the definition. So the line x equals c is a vertical asymptote to the graph of f. If the limit as x approaches uh, c from the left uh, and is infinity, or the limit as x approaches c from the right of f is infinity. Right? So in other words, we would like to see, how can we just like say immediately what are the, um, the vertical asymptotes. So how can we find those vertical asymptotes? So the way we are doing it, we're gonna find them in the following way. So we're gonna take out the, the denominator, right? You see, this is, a this is a fraction. And we look at the denominator, which is x minus three, and we will set this equal to zero. In other words, for the vertical asymptotes, that's what we do. So we need to find the value of x when the denominator of f of x is equal to zero, right? That's what we need to do. Right? All right, great. So in our case, the denominator, right? You see the denominator of f, right? That's what we need. Is this guy here? So that's the denominator of f. Is x minus three? So this means that we're going to set it equal, equal to zero. So x minus three equals zero. In other words, x equals three. So that will be what we call vertical asymptote. Great, and well, you can take the limit as x approaches um, three from the left, and it will give a negative infinity, and you can take uh, the right-hand limit, uh, the limit as x approaches three from the right of f, and it will give you positive infinity, right? So again, let me write this. Let me just write for this one here. 3 plus, right? And so this is the right-hand limit of 4x minus 2 over x minus 3. Well, if you plug it in, you will get, let's see, what do we get? So we get um, 4 times 3 minus 2. So it's 10 over, 
And pay attention, here is three plus minus three. So it's 10 over three plus minus three, it will be zero plus. So as we can see, if, uh, one over zero plus will be positive infinity. So this guy's positive. And the same thing will go for this one. So we'll leave this to you as an exercise. So in other words, that's what we have. So x equals three. So we have these two. Oh, true. So x equals three is a vertical asymptote. All right, great. What about horizontal asymptotes? What should we do? What about horizontal asymptotes? Oh, oh my God, yes. So what should we do for horizontal asymptote? We should take the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x, right? So for the horizontal asymptotes, we take the limit as x approaches infinity of 4x minus of f, which is the limit as x approaches infinity of 4x minus 2 over x minus 3. Well, what is this limit? What can you tell me? What is the value of this one? Well, what is it? If you plug it in, it's infinity over infinity. And now we're going to factor here. So let's do it. So this is the limb as x approaches infinity of x. Let's factor x to the greatest power here, which, uh, and we're left with uh, 4 minus 2 over x. And on the bottom, we have x times 1 minus 3 over x. What is the limit of this? Can you tell me? What? What is the limit? Four, exactly. So this just cancel. This will approach zero. This will approach zero. So the limit is four. So this means what? So just like in the case, uh, you can do it in a similar fashion. So divide or multiply by one over x. Anyways, the same thing. But in any case, the limit will give you four. Great. So this means that x if y equals four. So let's write this. Y equals four. And also similarly, the same thing will happen as uh, x approaches negative infinity. Anyway, I'll leave this to you as an exercise. But what I'm, my point is that y equals four is a horizontal asymptote. So let me write it again. Is a horizontal asymptote. That's what you need to know, right? Well, the question now that, and I'm probably going to leave this to uh, next time, given uh, that we have this information, can we sketch the graph of the function? The graph of f so what do we need? So now I'm going back to uh, what we discussed uh, at the beginning of the lecture and the, uh, in the previous lecture. So we need to do what? We need to find where the, or the extrema, the relative extrema. We need to find where the function is uh, increasing or decreasing. We need to find the uh, inflection points. We need to find the intervals of concavity. And then since we know what are the horizontal and uh, vertical asymptotes, we can sketch the graph. And I think I'm going to leave this for next time because we're out of time now. Uh, so I think I'm gonna stop here um, with the lecture. Like I said, I, haven't, uh, I would like to finish this example oh, and graphing the function of this uh, rational function. And also next time I'll do another example in the same fashion. And then uh, after this, we'll be talking about finally uh, about this uh, very uh, famous rule 
which is the L'Hopital rule. So it's going to be a long lecture because we will deal with many, many examples next time. All right, guys, I think I should, it's a good place for me to stop. Uh, please feel free to stop by uh, my office hours in like 11 minutes. Okay, take care. Bye-bye.